Section 1 of Zigzags of Treachery and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Winston Tharp. Zigzags of Treachery and Other Stories by Dashiell Hammett. Zigzags of Treachery, Part 1. Chapter One. All I know about Dr. Estep's death, I said, is the stuff in the papers. Vance Richmond's lean gray face took on an expression of distaste. The newspapers aren't always either thorough or accurate. I'll give you the salient points as I know them, though I suppose you'll want to go over the ground for yourself and get your information first hand. I nodded, and the attorney went on, shaping each word precisely with his thin lips before giving it sound. Dr. Estep came to San Francisco in 98 or 99, a young man of 25, just through qualifying for his license. He opened an office here, and, as you probably know, became in time a rather excellent surgeon. He married two or three years after he came here. There were no children. He and his wife seemed to have been a bit happier together than the average. Of his life before coming to San Francisco, nothing is known. He told his wife briefly that he had been born and raised in Parkersburg, West Virginia, but that his home life had been so unpleasant that he was trying to forget it, and that he did not like to talk or even think about it. Bear that in mind. Two weeks ago, on the third of the month, a woman came to his office in the afternoon. His office was in his residence on Pine Street. Lucy Coe, who was Dr. Estep's nurse and assistant, showed the woman into his office and then went back to her own desk in the reception room. She didn't hear anything the doctor said to the woman, but through the closed door she heard the woman's voice now and then a high and anguished voice, apparently pleading. Most of the words were lost upon the nurse, but she heard one coherent sentence. Please, please, she heard the woman cry, don't turn me away. The woman was with Dr. Estep for about fifteen minutes and left sobbing into a handkerchief. Dr. Estep said nothing about the caller, either to his nurse or to his wife, who didn't learn of it until after his death. The next day, toward evening, while the nurse was putting on her hat and coat, preparatory to leaving for home, Dr. Estep came out of his office with his hat on and a letter in his hand. The nurse saw that his face was pale, white as my uniform, she says, and he walked with the care of one who takes pains to keep from staggering. She asked him if he was ill. Oh, it's nothing, he told her. I'll be all right in a very few minutes. Then he went on out. The nurse left the house just behind him and saw him drop the letter he had carried into the mailbox on the corner, after which he returned to the house. Mrs. Estep, coming downstairs ten minutes later, it couldn't have been any later than that, heard, just as she reached the first floor, the sound of a shot from her husband's office. She rushed into it, meeting nobody. Her husband stood by his desk swaying, with a hole in his right temple and a smoking revolver in his hand. Just as she reached him and put her arms around him, he fell across the desk, dead. Anybody else? Any of the servants, for instance, able to say that Mrs. Estep didn't go into the office until after the shot? I asked. The attorney shook his head sharply. No, damn it. That's where the rub comes in. His voice, after this one flare of feeling, resumed its level, incisive tone, and he went on with his tale. The next day's papers had account of Dr. Estep's death, and late that morning, the woman who had called upon him the day before his death came to the house. She is Dr. Estep's first wife. 
which is to say, his legal wife. There seems to be no reason, not the slightest, for doubting it, as much as I'd like to. They were married in Philadelphia in 96. She has a certified copy of the marriage record. I had the matter investigated in Philadelphia, and it's a certain fact that Dr. Estep and this woman, Edna Fife was her maiden name, were really married. She says that Estep, after living with her in Philadelphia for two years, deserted her. That would have been in 98 or just before he came to San Francisco. She has sufficient proof of her identity that she really is the Edna Fife who married him, and my agents in the East found positive proof that Estep had practiced for two years in Philadelphia. And here is another point. I told you that Estep had said he was born and raised in Parkersburg. I had inquiries made there, but found nothing to show that he had ever lived there, and found ample evidence to show that he had never lived at the address he had given his wife. There is, then, nothing for us to believe except that his talk of an unhappy early life was a ruse to ward off embarrassing questions. Did you do anything toward finding out whether the doctor and his first wife had ever been divorced? I asked. I'm having that taken care of now, but I hardly expect to learn that they had. That would be too crude. To get on with my story, this woman, the first Mrs. Estep, had said that she had just recently learned her husband's whereabouts, and had come to see him in an attempt to effect a reconciliation. When she called upon him the afternoon before his death, he asked for a little time to make up his mind what he should do. He promised to give her his decision in two days. My personal opinion, after talking to the woman several times, is that she had learned that he had accumulated some money, and that her interest was more in getting the money than in getting him. But that, of course, is neither here nor there. At first, the authorities accepted the natural explanation of the doctor's death, suicide. But after the first wife's appearance, the second wife, my client, was arrested and charged with murder. The police theory is that after his first wife's visit, Dr. Estep told his second wife the whole story, and that she, brooding over the knowledge that he had deceived her, that she was not his wife at all, finally worked herself up into a rage, went to the office after his nurse had left for the day, and shot him with a revolver that she knew he always kept in his desk. I don't know, of course, just what evidence the prosecution has, but from the newspapers I gather that the case against her will be built upon her fingerprints on the revolver with which he was killed, an upset inkwell on his desk, splashes of ink on the dress she wore, and an inky print of her hand on a torn newspaper on his desk. Unfortunately, but perfectly naturally, one of the first things she did was to take the revolver out of her husband's hand. That accounts for her prints on it. He fell, as I told you, just as she put her arms around him, and though her memory isn't very clear on this point, the probabilities are that he dragged her with him when he fell across the desk. That accounts for the upset inkwell, the torn paper, and the splashes of ink. But the prosecution will try to persuade the jury that these things all happened before the shooting, that they are proofs of a struggle. Not so bad, I gave my opinion. Or pretty damned bad, depending on how you look at it and this is the worst time imaginable for a thing like this to come up. Within the past few months, there have been no less than five widely advertised murders of men by women who were supposed to have been betrayed or deceived or one thing or another. 
not one of these five women was convicted. As a result, we have the press, the public, and even the pulpit howling for a stricter enforcement of justice. The newspapers are lined up against Mrs. Estep as strongly as their fear of libel suits will permit. The women's clubs are lined up against her. Everybody is clamoring for an example to be made of her. Then, as if all that isn't enough, the prosecuting attorney has lost his last two big cases, and he'll be out for blood this time. Election day isn't far off. The calm, even precise voice was gone now, and its place was a passionate eloquence. "'I don't know what you think,' Richmond cried. "'You're a detective. This is an old story to you. You are more or less callous, I suppose, and skeptical of innocence in general. But I know that Mrs. Estep didn't kill her husband. I don't say it because she's my client. I was Dr. Estep's attorney and his friend, and if I thought Mrs. Estep guilty, I'd do everything in my power to help convict her.' "'But I know as well as I know anything "'that she didn't kill him, couldn't have killed him. "'She's innocent. "'But I know, too, that if I go into court "'with no defense beyond what I have now, "'she'll be convicted. "'There has been too much leniency shown feminine criminals,' "'public sentiment says. "'The pendulum will swing the other way. "'Mrs. Estep, if convicted, We'll get the limit. I'm putting it up to you. Can you save her? Our best mark is the letter he mailed just before he died, I said, ignoring everything he said that didn't have to do with the facts of the case. It's good betting that when a man writes and mails a letter and then shoots himself, that the letter isn't altogether unconnected with a suicide. Did you ask the wife about the letter? I did and she denies having received one. That wasn't right. If the doctor had been driven to suicide by her appearance, then according to all the rules there are, the letter should have been addressed to her. He might have written one to his second wife, but he would hardly have mailed it. Would she have any reason for lying about it? Yes, the lawyer said slowly. I think she would. His will leaves everything to the second wife. The first wife, being the only legal wife, will have no difficulty in breaking that will, of course. But if it is shown that the second wife had no knowledge of the first one's existence, that she really believed herself to be Dr. Estep's legal wife, then I think that she will receive at least a portion of the estate. I don't think any court would, under the circumstances, take everything away from her. But if she should be found guilty of murdering Dr. Estep, then no consideration will be shown her, and the first wife will get every penny. Did he leave enough to make half of it, say, worth sending an innocent person to the gallows for? He left about half a million, roughly. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars isn't a mean inducement. Do you think it would have been enough for the first wife, from what you've seen of her? "'Candidly, I do. "'She didn't impress me as being a person of very many active scruples. "'Where does his first wife live?' I asked. "'She's staying at the Montgomery Hotel now. "'Her home is in Louisville, I believe. "'I don't think you will gain anything by talking to her, however. "'She has retained Somerset, Somerset, and Quill to represent her, "'a very reputable firm, by the way.' and she'll refer you to them. They will tell you nothing. But if there's anything dishonest about her affairs, such as the concealing of Dr. Estep's letter, I'm confident that Somerset, Somerset, and Quill know nothing of it. Can I talk to the second Mrs. Estep, your client? Not at present, I'm afraid, though perhaps in a day or two. She is on the verge of collapse just now. She has always been delicate, and the shock of her husband's death, followed by her own arrest and imprisonment, have been too much for her. She's in the city jail, you know, held without bail. 
I've tried to have her transferred to the prisoner's ward of the city hospital, even, but the authorities seem to think that her illness is simply a ruse. I'm worried about her. She's really in a critical condition. His voice was losing its calmness again, so I picked up my hat, said something about starting to work at once, and went out. I don't like eloquence. If it isn't effective enough to pierce your hide, it's tiresome, and if it is effective enough, then it muddles your thoughts. Chapter 2 I spent the next couple of hours questioning the Estep servants, to no great advantage. None of them had been near the front of the house at the time of the shooting, and none had seen Mrs. Estep immediately prior to her husband's death. After a lot of hunting, I located Lucy Coe, the nurse, in an apartment on Vallejo Street. She was a small, brisk, business-like woman of thirty or so. She repeated what Vance Richmond had told me, and could add nothing to it. That cleaned up the S-step end of the job, and I set out for the Montgomery Hotel, satisfied that my only hope for success, barring miracles, which usually don't happen, lay in finding the letter that I believed Dr. Estep had written to his first wife. My drag with the Montgomery Hotel management was pretty strong, strong enough to get me anything I wanted that wasn't too far outside the law, so as soon as I got there, I hunted up Stacy, one of the assistant managers. This Mrs. Estep who's registered here, I asked. What do you know about her? Nothing myself, but if you'll wait a few minutes, I'll see what I can learn. The assistant manager was gone about ten minutes. No one seems to know much about her, he told me when he came back. I've questioned the telephone girls, bellboys, maids, clerks, and the house detective, but none of them could tell me much. She registered from Louisville on the second of the month. She has never stopped here before, and she seems unfamiliar with the city, asks quite a few questions about how to get around. The mail clerks don't remember handling any mail for her, nor do the girls on the switchboard have any record of phone calls for her. She keeps regular hours, usually goes out at 10 or later in the morning, and gets in before midnight. She doesn't seem to have any callers or friends. Will you have her mail watched? Let me know what postmarks and return addresses are on any letters she gets? Certainly. And have the girls on the switchboard put their ears up against any talking she does over the wire? Yes. Is she in her room now? No, she went out a little while ago. Fine. I'd like to go up and take a look at her stuff. Stacy looked sharply at me and cleared his throat. Is it as, uh, important as all that? I want to give you all the assistance I can, but... It's this important, I assured him, that another woman's life depends on what I can learn about this one. All right, he said. I'll get the clerk to let us know if she comes in before we're through, and we'll go right up. The woman's room held two valises and a trunk, all unlocked, and containing not the least thing of importance, no letters, nothing. So little, in fact, that I was more than half convinced that she had expected her things to be searched. Downstairs again, I planted myself in a comfortable chair within sight of the key rack, and waited for a view of this first Mrs. Estep. She came in at 11.15 that night, a large woman of 45 or 50, well-dressed, and carrying herself with an air of assurance. Her face was a little too hard to mouth and chin, but not enough to be ugly. Capable-looking woman. A woman who would get what she went after. Chapter 3 Eight o'clock was striking as I went into the Montgomery Hotel the next morning and picked out a chair, this time within eye range of the elevators. At 10.30, Mrs. Estep left the hotel with me in her wake. Her denial of the letter from her husband, written immediately before his death, had come to her, didn't fit in with the possibilities as I saw them, and a good motto for the detective business is, when in doubt, shadow him. After eating breakfast at a restaurant on O'Farrell Street, she turned toward the shopping district. And for a long, long time, though I suppose it was a lot shorter than it seemed to me, she led me through the most densely packed portions of the most crowded department stores she could find. She didn't buy anything, but she did a lot of thorough looking, with me muddling along behind her trying to act like a little fat guy on an errand for his wife, while stout women bumped me and thin ones prodded me and all sorts got in my way and walked on my feet. 
Finally, after I had sweated off a couple of pounds, she left the shopping district and cut up through Union Square, walking along casually as if out for a stroll. Three-quarters way through, she turned abruptly and retraced her steps, looking sharply at everyone she passed. I was on a bench, reading a stray page from a day-old newspaper when she went by. She walked on down Post Street to Kearney, stopping every now and then to look, or to pretend to look, in store windows, while I ambled along sometimes behind her, sometimes almost by her side, and sometimes in front. She was trying to check up the people around her, trying to determine whether she was being followed or not. But here, in the busy part of town, that gave me no cause for worry. On a less crowded street, it might have been different, though not necessarily so. There are four rules for shadowing. Keep behind your subject as much as possible. Never try to hide from him. Act in a natural manner, no matter what happens. And never meet his eye. Obey them, and except in unusual circumstances, shadowing is the easiest thing that a sleuth has to do. Assured, after a while that no one was following her, Mrs. Estep turned back toward Powell Street and got into a taxicab at the St. Francis stand. I picked out a modest touring car from the rank of hire cars along the Geary Street side of Union Square and set out after her. Our route was out Post Street to Laguna, where the taxi presently swung into the curb and stopped. The woman got out, paid the driver, and went up the steps of an apartment building. With idling engine, my own car had come to rest against the opposite curb in the block above. As the taxicab disappeared around a corner, Mrs. Estep came out of the apartment building doorway, went back to the sidewalk, and started down Laguna Street. Pass her, I told my chauffeur, and we drew down upon her. As we came abreast, she went up the front steps of another building, and this time she rang a bell. These steps belonged to a building apparently occupied by four flats, each with its separate door, and the button she had pressed belonged to the right-hand second-story flat. Under cover of my car's rear curtains, I kept my eye on the doorway while my driver found a convenient place to park in the next block. I kept my eye on the vestibule until 5.35 p.m. when she came out, walked to the Sutter Street car line, returned to the Montgomery, and went to her room. I called up the old man, the Continental Detective Agency's San Francisco manager, and asked him to detail an operative to learn who and what were the occupants of the Laguna Street flat. That night, Mrs. Estep ate dinner at her hotel and went to a show afterward, and she displayed no interest in possible shadowers. She went to her room at a little after eleven, and I knocked off for the day. Chapter 4 the following morning, I turned the woman over to Dick Foley and went back to the agency to wait for Bob Teal, the operative who had investigated the Laguna Street flat. He came in at a little after ten. A guy named Jacob Ledwich lives there, Bob said. He's a crook of some sort, but I don't know just what. He and Wap Haley are friendly, so he must be a crook. Porky Grout says he's an ex-bunko man who is in with a gambling ring now. But Porky would tell you a bishop was a safe ripper if he thought it would mean five bucks for himself. This Ledwich goes out mostly at night, and he seems to be pretty prosperous, probably a high-class worker of some kind. He's got a Buick, license number 645-221, that he keeps in a garage around the corner from his flat, but he doesn't seem to use the car much. What sort of looking fellow is he? A big guy, six feet or better, and he'll weigh a couple hundred easy. He's got a funny mug on him. It's broad and heavy around the cheeks and jaw, but his mouth is a little one that looks like it was made for a smaller man. He's no youngster, middle-aged. Suppose you tail him around for a day or two, Bob, and see what he's up to. Try to get a room or apartment in the neighborhood, a place you can cover his front door from. Chapter 5 Vance Richmond's lean face lighted up as soon as I mentioned Ledwich's name to him. Yes, he exclaimed. He was a friend, or at least an acquaintance of Dr. Estep's. I met him once, a large man with a particularly inadequate mouth. I dropped in to see the doctor one day, and Ledwich was in the office. Dr. Estep introduced us. What do you know about him? Nothing. 
Don't you know whether he was intimate with the doctor or just a casual acquaintance? No. For all I know, he might have been a friend, a patient, or almost anything. The doctor never spoke of him to me, and nothing passed between them while I was there that afternoon. I simply gave the doctor some information he had asked for and left. Why? Dr. Estep's first wife, after going to a lot of trouble to see that she wasn't followed, connected with Ledwich yesterday afternoon, and from what we can learn, he seems to be a crook of some sort. What would that indicate? I'm not sure what it means, but I can do a lot of guessing. Ledwich knew both the doctor and the doctor's first wife. Then it's not a bad bet that she knew where her husband was all the time. If she did, then it's another good bet that she was getting money from him right along. Can you check up his accounts and see whether he was passing out any money that can't be otherwise accounted for? The attorney shook his head. No, his accounts are in rather bad shape, carelessly kept. He must have had more than a little difficulty with his income tax statements. I see. To get back to my guesses, if she knew where he was all the time and was getting money from him, then why did his first wife finally come to see her husband? Perhaps because... I think I can help you there, Richmond interrupted. A fortunate investment in lumber nearly doubled Dr. Essep's wealth two or three months ago. That's it, then. She learned of it through Ledwich. She demanded, either through Ledwich or by letter, a rather large share of it, more than the doctor was willing to give. When he refused, she came to see him in person to demand the money under threat, we'll say, of instant exposure. He thought she was in earnest. Either he couldn't raise the money she demanded, or he was tired of living a double life. Anyway, he thought it all over and decided to commit suicide. This is all a guess or a series of guesses, but it sounds reasonable to me. To me, too, the attorney said. What are you going to do now? I'm still having both of them shadowed. There's no other way of tackling them just now. I'm having the woman looked up in Louisville, but you understand, I might dig up a whole flock of things on them, and when I got through, still be as far as ever from finding the letter Dr. Estep wrote before he died. There are plenty of reasons for thinking that the woman destroyed the letter. That would have been her wisest play. But if I can get enough on her, even at that, I can squeeze her into admitting that the letter was written and that it said something about suicide, if it did. And that will be enough to spring your client. How is she today? Any better? His thin face lost the animation that had come to it during our discussion of Ledwich and became bleak. She went completely to pieces last night and was removed to the hospital where she should have been taken in the first place. To tell you the truth, if she isn't liberated soon, she won't need our help. I've done my utmost to have her released on bail, pulled every wire I know, but there's little likelihood of success in that direction. Knowing that she is a prisoner, charged with murdering her husband, is killing her. She isn't young, and she has always been subject to nervous disorders. The bare shock of her husband's death was enough to prostrate her, but now you've got to get her out, and quickly— he was striding up and down his office, his voice throbbing with feeling. I left quickly. Chapter 6 From the attorney's office I returned to the agency, where I was told that Bob Teal had phoned in the address of a furnished apartment he had rented on Laguna Street. I hopped on a streetcar and went up to take a look at it. But I didn't get that far. Walking down Laguna Street after leaving the car, I spied Bob Teal coming toward me. Between Bob and me, also coming toward me, was a big man whom I recognized as Jacob Ledwich, a big man with a big red face around a tiny mouth. I walked on down the street, passing both Ledwich and Bob, without paying any apparent attention to either. At the next corner I stopped to roll a cigarette and steal a look at the pair. And then I came to life. Ledwich had stopped at a vestibule cigar stand up the street to make a purchase. Bob Teal, knowing his stuff, had passed him and was walking steadily up the street. He was figuring that Ledwich had either come out for the purpose of buying cigars or cigarettes, and would return to his flat with him, 
or that after making his purchase, the big man would proceed to the car line, where in either event Bob would wait. But as Ludwich had stopped before the cigar stand, a man across the street had stepped suddenly into a doorway and stood there, back in the shadows. This man, I now remembered, had been on the opposite side of the street from Bob and Ledwich, and walking in the same direction. He, too, was following Ledwich. By the time Ledwich had finished his business at the stand, Bob had reached Sutter Street, the nearest car line. Ledwich started up the street in that direction. The man in the doorway stepped out and went after him. I followed that one. A ferry-bound car came down Sutter Street just as I reached the corner. Ludwich and I got aboard together. The mysterious stranger fumbled with a shoestring several pavements from the corner until the car was moving again, and then he likewise made a dash for it. He stood beside me on the rear platform, hiding behind a large man in overalls, past whose shoulder he now and then peeped at Ledwich. Bob had gone to the corner above and was already seated, when Ledwich, this amateur detective, there was no doubting his amateur status, and I got on the car. I sized up the amateur while he strained his neck peeping at Ledwich. He was small, this sleuth, and scrawny and frail. His most noticeable feature was his nose, a limp organ that twitched nervously all the time. His clothes were old and shabby, and he himself was somewhere in his fifties. After studying him for a few minutes, I decided that he hadn't tumbled a Bob Teal's part in the game. His attention had been too firmly fixed upon Ledwich, and the distance had been too short thus far for him to discover that Bob was also tailing the big man. So when the seat beside Bob was vacated presently, I chucked my cigarette away, went into the car, and sat down, my back toward the little man with a twitching nose. Drop off after a couple of blocks and go back to the apartment. Don't shadow Ledwich any more until I tell you. Just watch his place. There's a bird following him, and I want to see what he's up to, I told Bob in an undertone. He grunted that he understood, and after a few minutes left the car. At Stockton Street, Ledwich got off, the man with the twitching nose behind him and me in the rear. In that formation, we paraded around town all afternoon. The big man had business in a number of pool rooms, cigar stores, and soft drink parlors, most of which I knew for places where you can get a bet down on any horse that's running in North America, whether at Tanferan, Tijuana, or Timonium. Just what Ledwich did in these places I didn't learn. I was bringing up the rear of the procession, and my interest was centered upon the mysterious little stranger. He didn't enter any of the places behind Ledwich, but loitered in their neighborhoods until Ledwich reappeared. He had a rather strenuous time of it, laboring mightily to keep out of Ludwich's sight, and only succeeding because we were downtown, where you can get away with almost any kind of shadowing. He certainly made a lot of work for himself, dodging here and there. After a while, Ludwich shook him. The big man came out of a cigar store with another man. They got into an automobile that was standing beside the curb and drove away, leaving my man standing on the edge of the sidewalk, twitching his nose in chagrin. There was a taxi stand just around the corner, but he either didn't know it or didn't have enough money to pay the fare. I expected him to return to Laguna Street then, but he didn't. He led me down Kearney Street to Portsmouth, where he stretched himself out on the grass, face down, lit a black pipe, and lay looking dejectedly at the Stevenson Monument, probably without seeing it. I sprawled on a comfortable piece of sod some distance away, between a Chinese woman with two perfectly round children and an ancient Portuguese in a gaily checkered suit, and we let the afternoon go by. When the sun had gone low enough for the ground to become chilly, the little man got up, shook himself, and went back up Kearney Street to a cheap lunch room, where he ate meagerly. Then he entered a hotel a few doors away, took a key from the row of hooks, and vanished down a dark corridor. Running through the register, I found that the key he had taken belonged to a room whose occupant was John Boyd, St. Louis, Missouri, and that he had arrived the day before. This hotel wasn't of the sort where it's safe to make inquiries, so I went down to the street again and came to rest on the least conspicuous nearby corner. Twilight came, and the street and shop lights were turned on. It got dark. The night traffic of Kearney Street went up and down past me. Filipino boys in their two dapper clothes, bound for the inevitable blackjack game. 
gaudy women still heavy-eyed from their day's sleep, plainclothes men on their way to headquarters to report before going off duty, Chinese going to or from Chinatown, sailors in pairs looking for action of any sort, hungry people making for the Italian and French restaurants, worried people going into the bail bond broker's office on the corner to arrange for the release of friends and relatives whom the police had nabbed, Italians on their homeward journeys from work, odds and ends of furtive-looking citizens on various shady errands. Midnight came, and no John Boyd, and I called it a day and went home. Before going to bed, I talked with Dick Foley over the wire. He said that Mrs. Estep had done nothing of any importance all day and had received neither mail nor phone calls. I told him to stop shadowing her until I solved John Boyd's game. I was afraid Boyd might turn his attention to the woman, and I didn't want him to discover that she was being shadowed. I had already instructed Bob Teal to simply watch Ledwich's flat to see when he came in and went out and with whom, and now I told Dick to do the same with the woman. My guess on this Boyd person was that he and the woman were working together, that she had him watching Ledwich for her so that the big man couldn't double-cross her, but that was only a guess and I don't gamble too much on my guesses. Chapter 7 The next morning I dressed myself up in an army shirt and shoes, an old faded cap, and a suit that wasn't downright ragged, but was shabby enough not to stand out too noticeably beside John Boyd's old clothes. It was a little after nine o'clock when Boyd left his hotel and had breakfast at the grease joint where he had eaten the night before. Then he went up to Laguna Street, picked himself a corner, and waited for Jacob Ledwich. He did a lot of waiting. He waited all day, because Ledwich didn't show until after dark. But the little man was well stocked with patience. I'll say that for him. He fidgeted and stood on one foot and then the other, and then even tried sitting on the curb for a while, but he stuck it out. I took it easy myself. The furnished apartment Bob Teal had rented to watch Ledwich's flat from was a ground-floor one across the street and just a little above the corner where Boyd waited, so we could watch him in the flat with one eye. Bob and I sat and smoked and talked all day, taking turns watching the fidgeting man on the corner and Ledwich's door. Night had just definitely settled when Ledwich came out and started up toward the car line. I slid out into the street, and our parade was underway again, Ledwich leading, Boyd following him, and we following him. Half a block of this, and I got an idea. I'm not what you call a brilliant thinker. Such results as I get usually are the fruits of patience, industry, and unimaginative plugging, helped out now and then maybe by a little luck. But I do have my flashes of intelligence, and this was one of them. Ledwich was about a block ahead of me, Boyd half that distance. Speeding up, I passed Boyd and caught up with Ledwich. Then I slackened my pace so as to walk beside him, though with no appearance from the rear of having any interest in him. Jake, I said without turning my head, there's a guy following you. The big man almost spoiled my little scheme by stopping dead still, but he caught himself in time, and taking his cue from me, kept walking. Who the hell are you? he growled. Don't get funny, I snapped back, still looking and walking ahead. It ain't my funeral. But I was coming up the street when you came out, and I seen this guy duck behind a pole until you was passed, and then follow you up. That got him. You sure? Sure. All you got to do to prove it is to turn the next corner and wait. I was two or three steps ahead of him by this time. I turned the corner and halted, with my back against the brick building front. Ledwich took up the same position at my side. "'Want any help?' I grinned at him, a reckless sort of grin, unless my acting was poor. "'No.' His little lumpy mouth was set ugly, and his blue eyes were hard as pebbles. I flicked the tail of my coat aside to show him the butt of my gun. "'Want to borrow the rod?' I asked. "'No.' He was trying to figure me out in small wonder. "'Don't mind if I stick around to see the fun, do you?' I asked mockingly. There wasn't time for him to answer that. Boyd had quickened his steps, and now he came hurrying around the corner, his nose twitching like a tracking dog's. 
Ledwich stepped into the middle of the sidewalk so suddenly that the little man thudded into him with a grunt. For a moment they stared at each other, and there was recognition between them. Ludwig shot one big hand out and clamped the other by his shoulder. "'What are you snooping around me for, you rat? Didn't I tell you to keep away from Frisco?' "'Ah, oh, Jake,' Boyd begged. "'I didn't mean no harm. I just thought that—' Ludwig silenced him with a shake that clicked his mouth shut and turned to me. "'A friend of mine,' he sneered. His eyes grew suspicious and hard again and ran up and down me from cap to shoes. "'How do you know my name?' he demanded. "'A famous man like you?' I asked in burlesque astonishment. "'Never mind the comedy,' he took a threatening step toward me. "'How'd you know my name?' "'None of your damn business,' I snapped. My attitude seemed to reassure him. His face became less suspicious. "'Well,' he said slowly, "'I owe you something for this trick, and how are you fixed?' I have been dirtier. Dirty is Pacific Coast Argot for prosperous. He looked speculative from me to Boyd and back. You know the circle? he asked me. I nodded. The underworld calls Wap Healy's joint the circle. If you'll meet me there tomorrow night, maybe I can put a piece of change your way. Nothing stirring, I shook my head with emphasis. I ain't circulating that prominent these days. A fat chance I'd have of meeting him there. Wap Healy and half his customers knew me as a detective. So there was nothing to do but to try to get the impression over that I was a crook who had reasons for wanting to keep away from the more notorious hangouts for a while. Apparently it got over. He fought for a while and then gave me his Laguna Street number. Drop in this time tomorrow. Maybe I'll have a proposition to make you, if you've got the guts. I'll think it over, I said noncommittally turned as if to go down the street. "'Just a minute,' he called, and I faced him again. "'What's your name?' "'Wisher,' I said. "'Shine, if you want a front one.' "'Shine Wisher,' he repeated. "'I don't remember ever hearing it before.' It would have surprised me if he had. I had made it up only about fifteen minutes before. "'You needn't yell it,' I said sourly, "'so that everybody in the burg will remember hearing it.' And with that I left him not at all dissatisfied with myself. By tipping him off to Boyd, I had put him under obligations to me and had led him to accept me at least tentatively as a fellow crook. And by making no apparent effort to gain his good graces, I had strengthened my hand that much more. I had a date with him for the next day, when I was to be given a chance to earn, illegally no doubt, a piece of change. There was a chance that this proposition that he had in view for me had nothing to do with the S-Step affair, but then again it might, and whether it did or not, I had my entering wedge at least a little way into Jake Ledwich's business. I strolled around for about half an hour, and then went back to Bob Teal's apartment. Ledwich come back? Yes, Bob said, with that little guy of yours. They went in about a half hour ago. Good. Haven't seen a woman go in. No. I expected to see the first Mrs. Estep arrive sometime during the evening, but she didn't. Bob and I sat around and talked and watched Ledwich's doorway, and the hours passed. At one o'clock, Ledwich came out alone. "'I'm going to tail him, just for luck,' Bob said and caught up his cap. Ledwich vanished around a corner, and then Bob passed out of sight behind him. Five minutes later, Bob was with me again. "'He's getting his machine out of the garage.' I jumped for the telephone and put in a rush order for a fast touring car. Bob, at the window, called out, Here he is! I joined Bob in time to see Ledwich going into his vestibule. His car stood in front of the house. A very few minutes, and Boyd and Ledwich came out together. Boyd was leaning heavily on Ledwich, who was supporting the little man with his arm across his back. We couldn't see their faces in the dark, but the little man was plainly either sick, drunk, or drugged. Ledwich helped his companion into the touring car. The red tail light laughed back at us for a few blocks and then disappeared. The automobile I had ordered arrived twenty minutes later, so we sent it back unused. A little after three that morning, Ledwich, alone and afoot, returned from the direction of his garage. He had been gone exactly two hours. End of Part One